Welcome to Drinking Bros, presented by GhostBed.com. Welcome to Drinking Bros Podcast, kids. Pen sucks. Pen does suck, Dan. World sucks right now, but we're here. We're fighting through it. We got a former Green Beret on the show. Mm -hmm. Joe Kent is here. D'Anthony, and he clapped like a man. You clapped like a goddamn man right before we came on the air. That's how we always start off the show, with a clap for our editors. You clapped like a goddamn man, so I feel like this is going to be a powerful show today. Absolutely, man. Been training for it. <laughs> yeah, you went to clap school? Went to clap school, man. <laughs> <laughs> take, take that as you will. Yeah, I will. <clears throat> isn't clap school in Fort Bragg? Like, isn't that uh, yes, where you get the yeah, clap? Yeah. It's the home, the home of the clap. <laughs> That's truer than than you you than a lot of people know. Yeah, I'm sure. I, I can't imagine it's worse than Marine bases, though. Right? I don't know. Look, no, they, I've they, heard the they stories from Jared a lot of and Matt. Behavior. Yeah. Marines. Well, why not? Don't we all? I guess. You know, has any one of us worn a rubber ever? Uh, no, I would never <laughs> do that. That's disgusting. It's against the law, right? <laughs> Back in the '90s, I guess. Oh, look at you. There's a lot of no comments out of you today, Joe. We got to open up today. We got to Brene Brown this shit and have you open up to the world today, Joe. Is that Joe. how you say her first name? I believe so. I thought yeah. it was Bryn. Eh, is it? I don't know. There's some kind of weird accent There's mark a tilde on it. Day Any, the, anytime the I see e. accent marks over somebody's name, I'm like, that person's an asshole. <laughs> like, just I'm knock jealous. that shit off. No. I want a tilde. No, we're, having an accent mark on your name is like, is like uh, having fuzzy dice in the mirror of your car. Eh. It's like you're peacocking unnecessarily. But it means you're down for a good time. Probably, yeah. Which she's, I like. Yeah, I, I'm sure she's into some uh, weird shit. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure she is. I'm sure she is. She's everywhere, though, by the way. Uh, but it's not about her. It's about you, Joe. Um, how, are you <laughs> right. feel, how are you feeling about the state of affairs in the world today? Man, not, uh, not so great. A little bummed out to see that we got so much division and strife here, uh, here at home. Yeah, you know the one who's got it figured out though is Seattle. They seem to be doing pretty yeah. pretty well right now. <laughs> they do, man. Autonomy, you know. They're 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 really making a go of it. Boy, I is there a is there a worse case of hey man, uh, let's not have police and do whatever we want in Seattle right now? Yeah, it seems like you know there's that that point where you let your kid throw a tantrum just for a little bit, but you probably shouldn't let them continue to throw a tantrum like for multiple days, and. They just haven't had any like adult supervision to step in there and, and say, "All right, you guys have you guys have destroyed enough." Why not? Well, you, you I, know I just can't figure it out. You know what's well here? The why not is because their mayor is a fucking dumb dumb. That woman. So even Chris Cuomo on CNN last night was lighting her ass up. Like, uh, yeah, this is like, she's like, "Yeah, we're gonna have the summer of love." He goes, he, he didn't even say. <laughs> it's like, what are you talking about? He, the the point he was making is like, look, I understand people are protesting and shit, but you've lost control of, your, of four to six blocks of your city. Yeah. Entirely. Yeah. And she goes, well, it's not like they've, you know, set up military checkpoints and stuff. It's more like a block party. No, it's not. There's armed people <laughs> walking around beating the shit out of people that come in through the, the cordon that they don't like. Yeah. Which I think, honestly, if you're out there um, and you feel like, you know, getting involved and just starting some shit, if you're bored, I guess, uh -huh. maybe get you and a couple of your armed friends because uh, Washington State is a pretty easy place to get a concealed carry permit. Is it really? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Very even for a non-resident. It took me. I did. Uh, I went in one day to the to the uh, courthouse, did fingerprints, the background check because of my military service. I didn't have to do any weapons qualification mm -hmm. or anything. And then, like, I think three and a half weeks later, the concealed carry permit showed up at my house in Oakland, California. Wow. Yeah. It was All dope. right. Wow. But anyways, I would I would get a group together, uh -huh. five or six people, and then try to um, breach that cordon. And then when they try to stop you, that is called uh, unlawful imprisonment. Yeah. And then if they put their hands on you and move you to a different location, even if it's a few feet away, that is kidnapping. So now you've witnessed a felony, and you can take armed action against them. Oh, that's great. Right? So if they have weapons, they've established themselves as the aggressor. You can literally smoke that person. I'm not saying to go fucking murder somebody. Obviously. I'm just saying if you want to fucking be an antagonist and show how ridiculous this whole premise is, you don't get to make up your own laws, homeboy. Sorry. Well, don't, don't you feel like people will be going there just to do that, like, over the weekend? <laughs> yeah, Joe Biggs probably will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would think so. I mean, why not? I mean, basically, the, the government there said that you can come do whatever the hell you want to do. So, I mean, you're kind of opening it up to any, any, anyone with any agenda or no agenda at all that wants to just go create chaos. They, they have a, you know, a kitchen pass to go do that in Seattle right now, which is pretty scary. 
Yeah, it uh, no is. one gives a fuck about Seattle. Uh, yeah, it's true. Let it burn. <laughs> Let it burn. Um, by the way, great hair, hombre. Really proud Thanks, of you. Man. Yeah, salad. Re- re- you know, respect salad on this one. I got a nice mane underneath this thing as well. But you're really crushing the game of life with that. Uh, that those locks right now, my man. Two two plus two plus years, man. When I retired from the military. I was like, I'm going to grow it out till till I can't take it anymore. So we're on two plus years. So. Is that what it is? As soon as you get out, you're like, dude, fuck this. I'm never getting a haircut again. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much, man. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, when, I re, when I was going to retire, I got a haircut just to put on a uniform and do the retirement ceremony thing. And my, my wife was like, hey, if you if you get another haircut for like two or three years, you're a total pussy. So here we are. Who's the most famous one in your family? You or your wife? Uh, my wife, rightfully so. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, his. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, this is the husband of Shannon Kent. Yes, uh, and she is, in my opinion, I do. I I love history, particularly when it pertains to uh, military and and in the intelligence community. And I've got to say, she's probably the most prolific female intelligence officer in the history of this country, just just based on stats alone. Like four to six hundred people probably uh, were killed or arrested because of her, mm-hmm. like terrorists. So that's like. Her and the her and the woman that helped track down uh, Bin Laden. Bin Laden, yeah. Like, there's no other two women that we know of, at least, that are even in the same fucking conversation as these two ladies. Yeah, man, I, it's it's pretty intense, right? Like, I, I'm sure the conversations you guys have had over the years have had to have been wild, right? Yeah, man. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, interesting times, and we kind of met through work, and that just was was sort of our life, really. Yeah, and it's fun. It's. Uh, I don't know where it stands now with uh, with everything that's going on. I know that there was a push to try to get uh, uh, a naval vessel named after her, and I know you and Marty Skolan are working on the book to memorialize her life and stuff uh, right yeah. now. Uh, Marty's a good dude, by the way, and he's navigated yeah. that. He's a great writer. I love DOD We're a big fan of Marty. Yeah, man, Marty's awesome. Yeah, he's navigated the whole DOD process before with his books. So hopefully, you guys don't get jammed up like. Like, like, like we did, yeah. We got jammed up on Matt's book, and I can only imagine because you know Matt had a fraction of what your wife uh, had, and it, I, I can only imagine what that process is going to be like for you guys. Yeah, we're hoping that like you guys and some other folks have gone before us. You guys kind of cleared the breach for us. Um, so, but we're we're prepared to you know get it submitted way in advance and all that. And we're talking mm-hmm. to them, talking to DOD, and trying to get everything smoothed out. But uh, hopefully, that should be coming out sometime late 21 or early 22 okay so, good good yeah and if you yeah. need the number of the lawyer <laughs> that gets it done at the end <laughs> i'm not i'm not yeah. kidding i'll slide it to you there's one guy who you call yeah. when you're absolutely fed up with the dod who reps yeah. uh anybody from the military who's uh trying to get their book passed to the dod a nice. f- that fucker gets approved in about 10 days after that so if it starts to stretch out uh just shoot me a text yeah um, we'll keep that in our back pocket man <laughs> hopefully hopefully we'll go that route but yeah Oh, uh, for sure. For sure. Um, tell me a little bit about your wife. Um, I know you guys met in, in 2013 during a special operations training course. Um, yep. And then you married shortly thereafter in 2014. But what's it like when you guys are both in like that at, at that level? Um, I mean, how, how crazy is your life at that point? I mean, pretty crazy when I reflect back on it at the time. You know, it's just sort of like your life. So it's your your normal day to day. But uh, actually, you know, um, meeting her and dating her and eventually marrying her kind of made life a little bit more easy because dating someone who wasn't like in the fold of special operations who hadn't deployed before didn't have to deal with all the stuff you deal with. Um, kind of just didn't really understand or, or, or made things more difficult. So meeting Shannon and, and us going through the whole dating process and all that when we we're both doing very similar things, it made it made it way easier so we could talk about stuff you know nothing we could you know not talking about like national secrets or anything but we could talk about what our like deployment time was going to be and you know just kind of make a go of it uh between the two of us so it was it was nice man we we lived a a pretty fast-paced life um now that i reflect back on it but at the time it just sort of felt like this is our this is our nine to five daily grind yeah yeah and she's uh man that that's i I agree with that i think a lot of dudes that are in the military have a lot of trouble connecting with people that don't have at least like it's not necessarily military service or even in government service but it's some kind of like hard ass attitude maybe i don't know exactly what it is but obviously yeah like when she was uh when she was killed she was in the thick of it she was balls deep yeah. balls deep in syria in the middle of that bullshit yep. like she had no fear 
Uh, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, that's definitely something that, that I think I personally find attractive too. So it's, it's interesting yeah. you say that. Yeah, it, it definitely made it a lot easier, man. Like just having that drive. Cause I think in previous relationship I have, when I come home and be like, guess what? I got this deployment. I'm going to go on. Isn't that exciting? Or guess what? I'm going to go away for training for a couple months on end. It, it was just a lot of friction there. And not to say that Shannon and I didn't, didn't have that, but she definitely understood a lot more when I was like, Hey, I need to, I need to go on this deployment. I understand you need to go on a deployment. It was just a, you know, much more in the same wavelength. What's it like from a, a husband and wife standpoint, knowing how dangerous your wife's job is and you can't protect her while she's yeah. away? What's, what's that like? Especially um, when you've organized your entire adult life and your career around protecting. That's like your whole fucking job. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like doubly fucked up. Yeah, it's, it's definitely weird, man. Cause as a dude, you know, you, you do feel the, the rightful obligation to defend your family, defend your wife. Um, I just had to tell myself a lot that she had been through a lot of the same training as me. Um, this wasn't her first rodeo. She was already, by the time I met her, she had already been down range a bunch. So I just sort of had to let the, you know, my trust in the organizations we both belong to and then her training kind of let that take over. But you still know in your back of your mind, no matter how good you are, it's one of those any given Sunday things. Mm -hmm. Like you still know if you, if you're over there in Syria and you, you saddle up and you go play the game, like it might not work out in your favor. So, I mean, I knew that getting into it she knew it getting into it but it was just one of those things where it's like this is this is the risk that we take for the uh for the jobs that we have yeah um and, and i hope this isn't too personal uh but what was it like getting the call um on the day she died yeah it was um uh pretty obviously it was really hard um but I had a good friend of mine who I'd been uh, in the military with who actually broke the the news to me because he, we were both uh, working for the government at a different capacity. Um, and he was my supervisor. So he found out ahead of time. Um, he actually found out that two females had been killed in, in Manbij. And that was all the information that we had. Mm. And so there's not a lot of women in, in yeah. our line of work. Um, and I knew the area that she was in. So he asked me where she was. And he was like, hey, I'm not going to not going to lie. There's two female KIA. So I had about an hour where we didn't fully know. And so I was trying to get a hold of her. Um, but then we got confirmation like shortly thereafter. So it was, uh, I kind of had a lot of logistics to do because I had to worry about getting myself back home. I had to contact her folks um, and then my folks. So it was, it was pretty weird. I mean, I kind of had a lot to do, which kind of helped keep me focused. So I really didn't, I don't think processed process her loss until like much later on but i kind of had the epiphany of like hey i we have two kids and now we're down one parent and so i always kind of thought i'd be the one that would get hurt and she'd have to kind of take over as a parent mm -hmm. um so i, I kind of realized hey, at that point like i'm i'm done doing commando stuff myself mm -hmm. so i'm gonna go uh just focus on being a dad yeah because you you've got two boys correct i do yeah two little boys I, I can only imagine not only losing your wife, but then being a single father to two boys. I've got two boys on my own, and I can tell you if I lost yeah. my wife, I, I don't know what I would do, to be honest with you. I mean, she did every, yeah. she does everything for our family uh, behind the scenes, and uh, yep. um, I can only imagine how difficult that's been on you personally. Yeah, I mean, so I, I, I never really planned on transitioning out of the, the line of work that, that we were in, um, and so I didn't, I didn't exactly have a transition plan. Um, and then taking over as a full-time dad, like Shannon, from the time we had kids on, she didn't really go on any deployments. She was only gone for maybe 10 days at the most. So she had been the primary care provider. And like you said, I mean, just doing everything behind the scenes. And when I was around, I do, I do as much as I could, but it was, uh, it was pretty drastic. So luckily my, my parents, um, and then her, her family had been super supportive. So I actually just moved back home to Oregon. Uh, bought a house pretty close to my folks so that that that, that helps out a lot it gives the, gives my kids some stability and then you know frees me up to, to do a little bit of work here and there but it's still my life two three years ago was very different day to day than it is like right now so i still have moments where i'm like this is like kind of like bizarre like a weird dream yeah i, I bet i mean man uh <laughs> again just thinking about it now and, and having two two boys on my own um, yeah. it would be such a drastic lifestyle change. I've got a dumb civilian question for you. It, 
do you get life insurance? Are you able to have life insurance doing the jobs that you guys have? Well, the, the yeah, the DOD and the U.S. government provides it. So okay. it's, yeah, I, I'd imagine if you wanted additional life insurance and you had an honest conversation with <laughs> your, your the, provider, uh, provider yeah, probably, yeah, you'd probably get denied. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's it's all through the it's all through the military and the, the U.S. government. Because I, I wonder when something like this happens to, to somebody like you who's in the military and then you've got two, two boys to look after, like, are you able to just leave and say, hey, guys, here's my situation. I need to go home and, and take care of my, my boys or like, how, how does that work out in the military? Yeah, I was lucky. So I, I had already retired. Um, so I was already done with like the military. I was working for the U.S. government. Um but they'll if you're if you're a single parent they'll take care of you they'll let you stay in or get out um and the uh america is obviously an Amer amazing country and mm -hmm. they, we do a pretty good job of taking care of the families of the fallen so uh between the government and then charity organizations like families of the fallen like can can still live a really good life and not have to worry about all the minor things like can i pay for child care can i pay for health insurance that's um that's all taken care of, which is, which is, I've actually been overwhelmed since losing my wife um, with a number of people that are like, Hey, can we do X and Y Z for you? Can we give you money? Like I mean, about a year ago, I had to say like, Hey, like I'm good. I really appreciate it. Um, and I still get hit up kind of all the time of like, Hey, what can we do for you? And I'm like, man, I, I'm good. Thank you. Uh, it's great to hear that you have that much support though. But I guess at this yeah, point, it at this point, it's uh, what can we do for her? Like what, how, yeah. how do we honor this woman that, gave so much for a country not just gave like a lot of people sacrifice but it, you, you, you also have to weigh her body of work against this right mm -hmm. like i said in my opinion there is no female in the history of the united states military or intelligence apparatus that has done as much as this woman right um which is why i was super disappointed to me when the uh, ndaa dropped that amendment uh, that was yeah. supposed to have the battleship or whatever named after. I don't know why. I don't know why it didn't go through. I have no idea why. Of all the other bullshit that got that gets into the National Defense Authorization Act every year, why yeah. that didn't make the cut? Like that's fucked up to me. Well, look, they're trying to change the names of uh, bases and ships right now, anyway. So fuck it. Why not? Yeah. Swap one yeah, out. Why not? Yeah, swap one yeah. out now. Um, you you have a great opportunity out there if you're listening. Uh, swap one out for for her name. Mm. Um, for for those of of uh, the audience who are not so familiar with her story, what makes her uh, as great as, uh, as well, everybody says she is? To, in my opinion, and obviously her husband's probably going to know more, but mm -hmm. I've done a lot of research on her and just uh, about the community in general. Uh, one, it's uh, giant balls, mm -hmm. like big ones. Sure. And the other part is she's fucking brilliant. Speaks five, spoke five languages. Like had a knack for understanding the way the intelligence community worked, how to how to get information from assets, how to work people without blowing uh, cover and stuff like that. She was, I don't, she's just a natural at, at doing all this stuff. And I I hate to say that someone was a natural at something because it almost implies they didn't do a lot of work to get there. Obviously, she did a lot of work to get there as well. But she was just very well suited for that position, like like Michael Jordan of intelligence kind of situation. And I would like to hear what you have to say as well, Joe. Yeah. It, would you sum her up as that is the Jordan of, of intelligence, national yeah, intelligence? Man, that's a, she would punch me in the shoulder if I said that, if she was here, but yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I, I told her that like all the time. Um, she was a, she had a natural ability to pick up languages. So that's mm -hmm. kind of what drove her in the Navy after nine 11, both her uh, uncle and her father were nine 11 first responders, mm -hmm. firefighter and a, and a cop. So after that, she was like, I gotta, I gotta go do something. So she knew that she could learn languages pretty quick. She self-taught uh, French and Spanish. So she went to the recruiters and Army and Navy recruiters and even Air Force recruiters and said, hey, I want to go learn Arabic. Then the Navy bit first. So that's what put her in the Navy. And then I'd also say like her tenacity and drive. She, she knew that she wanted to get into the shit. Um, and at the time, in the mid-2000s, there wasn't a clear path for women to really get on the front lines. It still happened. But there was still technically that ban from women fighting on the front lines. So she worked her way from behind a desk translating Arabic just based on her willing to throw up her hand and say, hey, I'll go do that. And at the time, there wasn't a lot of people that wanted to go talk to local local assets to get information from them. So she was like, I speak Arabic. I'll go talk to this dude. So she kind of found her way, even though that wasn't what she was uh, trained for by the military. She found her way into that. And then from there, 
um, the SEALs that she was providing intelligence for were like, hey, you're pretty good at this. You just want to keep going on operations with us. So from there, she just continued to volunteer and her tenacity kind of pushed her through into the special operations community before there was a way that a woman could really go sign up and, you know, go to a selection process. Mm -hmm. How many terrorists would you say she probably brought down? I mean, the uh, the official report, which is, I mean, who the fuck knows, uh, but the, the quote I've seen most is something like between four and 500 uh, terrorists have either been killed or captured because of intelligence that she uh, developed. Yeah. Um, so that's quite a few. Yeah, yeah. Like my, just for perspective, my entire uh, 82nd Airborne Battalion rolled up 140 dudes over the course of 18 months or 15 mm -hmm. months. And uh, she did 3x that amount in her career. Man. So it's pretty, pretty impressive. And I got to think that at least in some small way, some of the, at least one of the two women, if not both, uh, on SEAL team, the show SEAL team, mm -hmm. have to be her. Based on her. Yeah. Yeah. But like Jessica Pari or Tony Truck's uh, character on those shows probably are based on her. Have you thing. seen that? Have you seen the show and thought to yourself, man, that, that's, that's exactly like my wife? Yeah, yeah, I've seen that. Like, yeah, that's pretty cool. Like, they actually included a female character there because, you know, I, I think prior to Shannon getting killed, unless you were in the community, you really didn't think that there was any women that were assisting any of these special operations teams out doing stuff. It's been happening for a while, but yeah. I think until she got killed, I just don't think a lot of folks realized that was going on. So it's cool to see SEAL team throw that in there. Yeah, it's not a, not exactly the uh, the Middle East isn't exactly a conducive environment for white women. To no, operate yeah, in no, for the most no. part, yeah. I don't so. think it will be, or just women in general, but any women, but <laughs> <Right>. particularly <laughs> yeah. Western women, yeah. yeah, they're not big fans of that. Uh, but it is, yeah, I agree. I, I know all the people on that show, and they're, uh, I, I've never asked them about it, but maybe I should the next time we have one of them on because I'm they have to know this story, like they go deep, like half the, the people that are, uh, extras mm -hmm. like whenever they have a storyline where it's an extra SEAL team that comes in or, uh, uh, whatever the fuck, like a different unit that comes in, it's always active duty Navy SEALs that they just pull up from Coronado and oh, really? throw on the show. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. <clears throat> um, Dan, you were talking about honoring her memory earlier. Um, is there a better way, in my opinion, than, than to honor her memory by, by writing a book about her life and getting her story out there to the world even more? Um, because there is, there's some people who are unfamiliar with her story. And I think, yeah. I think a book is not only necessary, but it is important for the world um has this process been cathartic for you um going back and 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 thinking about her life and the memories you have and and trying to get it out to the world yeah there's been um it's been super cathartic actually like there's been times where like i've had to write stuff that was super painful and it took me <laughs> way longer than i thought it would because you know i like to think of myself as somewhat of like a tough guy and i'm like man this is like kind of kicking my ass writing down raw emotions and raw memories but it's been it's been really good man um and then marty it's been super helpful mm -hmm. you know like i'll write something i'll send it to him and he'll be like hey that's perfect or that's you know you know torque it this way torque it that way um to really help me work through the writing but like you said it's been super cathartic and just going through all the all the good times and all the memories it's been nice and it, it'll also be really good for when you know my boys are older they can actually just as opposed to listening to me tell them stories they can sit down and, and read about their mom yeah, that's great just to memorialize it like that into into uh, I mean into perpetuity I guess. And she's she's not the first female intelligence uh operator if you want to call it that mm -hmm. to to die in the line of duty. I mean there's uh the Chapman attack that we all I mean like from zero dark 30 that mm -hmm. you know that yep. yeah, yeah yeah. They they kind of flubbed some of the facts in that obviously cuz it's Hollywood but uh what was her name? Jennifer Matthews was one, and uh, Elizabeth Hansen both died there. And there have been others as well. So it's, like, important to tell that story because um, for there's the for females in the military, I think the military is comprised of, what, like 13% female? So it's, it's really low. Yeah. It's, it's pretty small. low, yeah. So, I mean, um, <clears throat> we need the best and brightest to be for, – for every job that, that supports our country, obviously. Yeah. But it's particularly – important for um like military and first responders and police to have representation of all the different people that make up what america is and 51 percent of america are female mm -hmm. right so it's uh <clears throat> i think it's incumbent upon us to tell these stories uh regardless of how uncomfortable they might make us 
Yeah, because if you don't talk about the best and the brightest, then no one else has anything to look up to. No, it's or, the reason. Or right. standard. It's the uh, reason U.S. men's soccer sucks. Yeah. <laughs> because there's there's all this all the competition for athletes go somewhere else. Right. Like I want the smartest and toughest people to be defending our country instead of, you know, maybe maybe doing something else. Right. Like that's what yeah. I want because I, I I love this country and I want if you're a if you're a that's why Major League Baseball back in the day started that inner city baseball thing. They wanted more black kids to play baseball. Sure. Uh it's it's the same concept and and we have to the only way to to get that going is to have heroes yes i agree you know what i mean like people that somebody to look up to somebody that's walked that path before and i'm like if if she could do it i can do it it's yeah it's really important has has there been a point during this writing process where marty's asked you to dig a little deeper on some of these stories um and some things are just too raw for you to to really unleash yeah i mean we, we were going through like writing our draft of our, our literary proposal there was definitely some some times in there we were going through just, you know, Hey, this is major milestones in our life. And, uh, I, I kind of had to dig deep and, and kind of push through some of it, especially when Marty and then our, uh, our agent were like, Hey, like we, we really need you to tell the the love story or the, you know, the story of loss and all that type of stuff. Um, but yeah, it, it was, it was definitely more of a gut check than, than I thought it would be. I thought it'd be a simple act of just writing down my memories and that ended up being, um, probably helping me process what happened, you know? So it, it was pretty painful. Yeah. Writing a biography is a, a different beast. And like, you know, the more personal you are, uh, the better the book is. And then, you know, obviously the, the more memorable it is for everyone else, because when people read a, a biography about, about someone as great as your wife, they want the details that only, you know, um, yeah. you know, where it's, you know, that needs to be shared with the entire world as well and not just save for yourself. And, and oftentimes that's hard for people. Yeah, man, it's uh, so that, that's what I tell myself, you know, like I, I really want the, uh, the full scope of like her life and then how loving she was. Cause I think everyone knows that oh, they'll be able to read about all the badass stuff that she did. But I, I really want to, my portion of the book is to bring out like what our relationship was like, what our relationship, what her relationship with the kids was like, and then just how much, love she showed you know in every aspect of her life because that's that's to me is the story of of her marty's going to take care of you know talking about her her military career and mm -hmm. and all of her accomplishments but my my part my my contribution is going to be you know telling the the story of shannon's love i'm excited about it uh have you jumped ahead mentally to who might play her in a movie because you know that's next next and, and, know, and the agents yeah. always ask they always ask yeah yeah, I gotta get way, way better on like who my my female actresses are. The the, the um who's the who's the lady from Zero Dark Thirty? She she keeps oh, coming to mind. Jessica Chastain. Yeah, Jessica yeah. Chastain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But she I mean, already she did Zero Dark did. Thirty. Yeah, she can't. She's not gonna do both. Yeah, exactly. So she probably can't take it. So I'm probably gonna find another like redheaded, you know, badass chick that can that can step up to it. So. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. hard part is gonna be, man. It's gonna be a Democrat. You know that. <laughs> I wouldn't it's want Hollywood man, so. if, if I was an, yeah, if I was an right. actor I don't know if I could like take that kind of role to be honest like I particularly like think think about um uh homeboy playing Chris Kyle right? yes yeah. and look yeah. Chris Kyle was Chris Kyle he he was a flawed human being like everybody else I'm not gonna get into all that shit but uh uh he was very involved in the the writing process mm -hmm. um and it would be like that's got to be a tremendous amount of pressure to look into the eyes of Chris Kyle's wife and and promise her that you're going to tell that story the right way. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it it's heavy, and I I can only imagine like um, you know, for the most part, I think all actors go in you know all in with an open mind and heart. I don't know too many people who take on those kind of roles who are just kind of eh. It's a gig and it pays yeah. X amount of dollars, but uh, <clears throat> this one would, is is definitely special. Well, I thought Bradley Cooper did a good job he did, portraying yeah. not just the intensity of that job and, and the situation, but also the the very flawed nature of human beings. Mm -hmm. Like it's not we we have such a strange relationship with with heroes in this country, whether it be athletes or military members or police, as you can see now. Or the people who are, <laughs> are, are murdered by police, like George Floyd, for example, is a very deeply flawed man. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Kobe Bryant, who was who died recently, yep. very deeply flawed man. He's had his troubles. Yeah, right. No one's perfect, 
and to be able to tell that story is is got to be it's got to be difficult but i think it's important to understand that these these people that we think of as heroes are people who decided against everything their brain and body are telling them the fear the doubt the 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 uh you know just the intensity of the situation and they pushed on and did what they were supposed to do anyway you know what i mean um knowing that they're going to be now that their story is being told they're going to be open to criticism all this other stuff i think it's a big deal and i think we need as a country to look at how we how we see these people you know what i mean like just because i've made some bad decisions in my life doesn't mean that the act i'd that I did wasn't important, right? Yeah, or noble, yeah. And I, I don't know. Um, I, I have I struggle with that myself sometimes too. Like, <laughs> I'm not. This is not what we're fucking here to talk about or anything. But Martin Luther King fucked everybody except for his wife. Yeah. But that doesn't lessen the f- impact he had on America. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, there you could be deeply flawed and still be a very important cultural figure. And I think it. I think we need to address that head on sometimes because if we don't then some dumb dumb is going to go, well, he was fucking his, fucking his mistress. Like, all right, dude, I yeah, got yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. But that's not what we're talking about right now. We're not talking about the bad shit he did. We're talking about the good shit he did. And you bringing up the bad shit he did doesn't, doesn't make the good shit he did any less good. Let's talk about that for a minute. But, you know, it's difficult for these people. It you is. Know, it really is. I'm going to toss Amy Adams <laughs> into the ring for you. Uh, I'm going to toss that hat into the ring. She's fantastic. I have to look her up, man. What, what she? What was she? Uh, she played uh, Lois Lane in the Superman movies with Henry Cavill. Oh yeah, she's in that okay. HBO series. She's a little... uh, she got nominated in the HBO series. Um, oh man, what was it called? She, I think she's been nominated for four. She's Oscars. a great actress. She yeah, she might be yeah. she might be a little frail to play Shannon though. Shannon was kind of a badass. I haven't seen her play a badass character. She'll book up. She was in that HBO series. Which um, which one are you talking about? It was the one where she was she had a bunch of scars on her body. She got nominated like a gajillion times for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you take a peek, sees at it. I'm going to get to the sponsors real quick. Um, sure, and and after the sponsors, we're going we're gonna to talk about what you're doing now and, <laughs> uh, and where your focus mm. is. Sharp Objects. Yeah, Sharp Objects. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jesse and I watched the whole goddamn thing. I haven't seen it. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's good if you're uh, in, into it. I go, uh, what's her name? The South African woman. Uh, Charlize Theron. Yeah, but okay. just give her a little ginger hair. Yeah, give her a little ginger hair. She's good. <laughs> Ging it up a little bit. Ging it up, dude. Yeah. Ging it up. Yep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we got some sponsors to pay for this show to be on the air, Joe. I apologize here, but again, afterwards, we're going to talk about uh, everything that you're doing now. Um, first and foremost, ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros. Finest mattresses in the land. And we've confirmed that their beds are not actually haunted. Yes, I was worried about that for a while because I've been watching. Not haunted. I w- one of the things I like to do is uh, uh, do some recreational things and then watch movies mm-hmm. uh, that are fucked up. Yeah, and I've been watching some horror movies lately just because I'm running out of content. And I was like, oh shit, I'm sleeping on a fucking ghost bed right now. Yeah, you know those dumb high thoughts you have. Yeah, You're like oh no, I'm sleeping on a ghost bed, <laughs> but it doesn't really mean anything. It's stupid. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then I realized this morning, I'm like, oh, it's not. Haunted. Not haunted. And yeah. we uh, confirmed <laughs> on the show yesterday that uh, ghost beds uh, don't have AIDS. AIDS on free. Them. AIDS free. Or yeah. COVID. Yeah. No COVID, yeah. uh, no AIDS, and they are ghost free. And they, um, they didn't the tell bed. us to say this, by the way. This is. No, we're just doing it yeah. because we love it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So when you open the box, there was no uh, paranormal activity that will be or, happening or in, inside your bedroom. Um, or, or COVID, AIDS, or COVID, uh, which is really important. That's the mattress yeah. you're looking for. Everything is 25 percent off at GhostBed.com forward slash Drinking Bros. And right now, if you get a mattress, you get two free pillows. As always, the 25 percent off is applicable with their 36 month pay as you go program. No interest at GhostBed.com forward slash Drinking Bros. D'Anthony, yep. uh, who do we got up <laughs> next? Uh, what day is this? Eh, it's Monday. When is the show going out? Sunday oh, night Monday. at eight. Sometimes we record for the audience. We record the the Friday afternoon shows. We we like mm. to get we like to get down with people. Let's do. We, we uh, launch those Sunday. Let's night. do Kill Cliff and let's do Express VPN because yeah, let's do it. Express VPN is a little bit on. Uh, it's it's on uh, on point for this. It is. Yeah, we're talking about intelligence. Yeah, uh, expressvpn.com dot com yeah. uh, forward slash drinking bros. Um, that'll protect your digital butthole. Do you have a VPN? 
Joe. I do, man. Rocking it right now. Yeah, God damn right, dude. You got to. Seven dollars yeah. a month. You got to have a VPN. Everybody's got a fucking VPN. Uh, if you go to expressvpn.com forward slash drinking bros today, uh, seven dollars a month, you get three months for free if you <clears> sign up for a year. And uh, nobody would be hacking your shit. Yeah, and I don't want to put you on the spot, Joel, but uh, military members, especially dude ones, have a yeah. very special relationship to VPNs. When we're on, they do. When we're on nipper and sipper lines overseas, uh-huh. uh, sometimes we need to access content that isn't, I don't know, the DOD doesn't like it. Pornography? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Porn and fucking movies like social media and Netflix and all kinds of shit. Sure. Uh, yeah, you gotta. sometimes you got to... Get yeah, around it. You get so. a VPN, dude. It's a it's a seamless app that runs in the background of your phones, laptops, uh, desktops, hard tops, hard tops, uh, <laughs> you name it. Uh, ExpressVPN.com forward slash Drinker Bros has got it. <laughs> and it'll help you get through the hard times, speaking no matter of, where you are in this world. Speaking of porn, I looked up, I I, I searched the phrase "ginger actress" <laughs> yeah. on Google, and it took me to an IMDb page that's the most beautiful natural redhead actresses. And number ten is actually uh, Faye Reagan, who is just a porn star. Yes, she's just a porn star, <laughs> not an actress. Yeah, big fan of Faye Reagan. <laughs> Wouldn't recommend her to play your wife in this movie, whatsoever, <laughs> Joe. I want to I want to put that on the record, but she is a, a very talented uh, actress. Ooh, in the Kate Mara. World. That'd be a good one. Oh, Kate Mara be great. That's, that's who you got. Yeah. yeah. yeah you, you knew that is from uh, Shooter. Yes. Yeah. Uh, she's also yeah. the owner of the Giants' daughter, uh, granddaughter. Really? So, I didn't yeah. know that. Like yeah. the New York Giants or the yeah. San Francisco Giants? New York Giants. Hmm, better. Football team, yeah. I, I like the New York and Rooney, Giants. Rooney Mara is a sister. That's yes. her sister. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, who else? Who's on that top ten before we get to our last sponsor here? Um, let's Eds. see. N- number one is Nicole Kidman. She's too old, obviously. Um, although she might be aging. still a banger, though she might be aging in reverse. Still a banger. Did you see her in uh, what's the Reese Witherspoon show on HBO? Uh, Big Little Lies. Big Little Lies. Shit. I don't yeah. remember. All season one, she's nude the entire time, and I'm like, my God, man. Thanks. Uh, thank you, HBO. Then there's Amy Adams, number two. Julian Moore. Adams. There we go. Julian Moore is number three. Julian Moore is probably a little older, I would imagine. Yeah. She's in her late fifties yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, Lindsay Lohan, we can go ahead and scratch that off of it. <laughs> yeah. What if Hollywood came back to you and said, Hey Joe, so we found our girl. We searched high and low and we came back with Lindsay Lohan to play your wife. You'd be like, fuck off. <laughs> might have might have to renegotiate the terms there. Yeah. <laughs> It's too late. It's going out. All uh, of a sudden, it's yeah. a Lifetime movie, and she's killing Bin Laden herself, and you're like, wait a minute. That's the <laughs> wrong person. Uh, let's see. Karen uh, Gillen, although we, you, you wouldn't recognize her as a redhead probably because she plays Nebula in the, uh, in the Marvel movies. Okay. Like yeah. uh, Gamora's sister yeah, or whatever. I yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, yeah. probably wouldn't recognize her in real life. Um, Christina Hendricks. From Mad Men, obviously. <sighs> Christina Hendricks, though. The only thing I think is damn titties. Yeah, like, she's... she's the biggest uh, press I've ever seen yeah, on, a, she's, on a woman. She's got some problems with her back, probably. Um, Isla Fisher is one. I don't know. She's too, like, weird and quirky, maybe. But she could do it. She's a pretty she, decent So she's met. Do you know who Isla Fisher is? She's married. I don't know. She was in Wedding Crashers. She was the... The uh, crazy redhead from the Wedding The crazy redhead who was with Vince Vaughn. Oh, okay. Yeah, as long, I haven't I'll seen that in a long time. You. Her, her <laughs> Me best, neither. But, her best movie is, is Hot Rod, though. Because yeah, she's, hot, she's great in Hot yeah. Rod, but she's married to Sasha Baron Cohen. Yeah, she's married to Borat. The so. two of those guys huh. are surprisingly great dramatic actors yeah. as well. She, I, she could pull it off for sure. Uh, yeah. Um, next is Allison Hannigan. Mm, maybe. Mm. I've never seen her in a real series. No, role. she was uh, from American Pie and How I Met Your Mother. Yeah. No. Um, let's see. I'm Elite. going Amy Adams on this one still. I think Amy Adams is the pick so yeah. far. She was number two on IMDb. I'm holding firm on that. Alicia Witt, but again, she's older. She's She was born in 75. I know so Alicia Witt. Yeah, she's uh, <laughs> Alicia Witt's a great actress. And then there's uh, Faye Reagan, obviously. Faye Reagan, yeah. yeah. Obviously. Obviously. Obviously, Faye Reagan's on, on the top ten list. Yeah. How that worked out on IMDb, I have no idea. I don't know, but I think Kate Mara's up there, too. She's, a she's good, good. She's a good actress. I mean, Brokeback Mountain. Yeah, 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 yeah. No. She navigated this that whole situation pretty Pretty fluidly. Yeah. Yes, she did. <laughs> uh, and if you're trying to navigate your, your situation fluidly at home, get some of that KillCliffCBD.com fluid running through your body. 25 milligrams in every single can. Three amazing flavors. You will not piss hot. It is THC free. Um, and again, best in the biz. If you're going to have a drinkable that is a CBD, the only name you can trust in this business is KillCliff. They've been around forever. Obviously, they're huge in the CrossFit community. But uh, it's another veteran-owned company, mm-hmm. D'Anthony. Uh, go to KillCliffCBD.com. Promo code Bros gets you 20% off and free shipping off a case. 
Uh, Joe, what are you doing these days? Um, are you working with uh, the, the Trumps? I am, yeah. So I'm working with uh, military families for Trump and veterans for Trump right now. So helping out with the election campaign, um, mostly focused on like veterans issues, but foreign policy and mm. Trump's approach to the uh, the global war on terror is what I've been trying to okay. focus my efforts on. Well, let's talk about that because I'm, yeah. I'm not a huge yeah. fan of uh, the Trumpster, uh, mostly because I'm jealous of his hair. I think uh, – Still got a lot of hair at 73. Like it's, it, it's, it, does. it defies gravity. That's the part that I like about it. It's, it's not about aesthetics for me. It's about the scientific element. Mm -hmm. Like how, did, how, why, and how. Why, probably, for a philosophy and then how for science. Sure, sure. Uh, which are two of my favorite subjects. I don't understand it. But uh, he's lately done some weird shit vis-a-vis -vis the military, and not necessarily that affect military members directly, just the way that he uses them and talks about it. So I'm kind of curious what it is from your guys' perspective that makes – um, I mean, look, if we're going to debate between him and Biden, that's not really a debate. Biden's a no. sleepy old turd. He's got dementia and he's he um, might be is, dead in, he's, in an hour. Yeah, he's racist as fuck. So uh, I'm just curious. What, what's your what's your elevator pitch for Trump? Like why support him versus anyone else? Yeah. So the biggest thing I would say is that Trump is an outside the box thinker, especially when it comes to foreign policy. His whole concept of America first is something that we haven't had in politics Um the first thing that Trump did when he came on the political scene before he even won election was he, he told the Republicans that, hey, you guys have gotten it wrong for your entire time, at least at least in our lifetime. So with the global war on terror starting with George Bush, mm -hmm. that was the first thing Trump did. He said, hey, you guys have gotten this wrong. We sought out to go after the folks that uh, conducted 9-11. And then shortly thereafter, we deviated into multi, almost multi-decades long ex experiments of nation building based on this ideology that has yet to see a return on investment. You can, you can debate the whether or not it's a good concept or not, but it's really gotten us nowhere. So that was the first thing that Trump did. And then he got the nomination. Um, so I, I really appreciate the way that he flipped the Republican Party around to a yeah. more pragmatic uh, outlook. Um, I agree with and that, And then he actually. took apart the Obama administration. Yeah, I, I agree with that first yeah. part, especially because, look, the Iraq war was just basically Dick Cheney committing in my opinion, treason to make all of his friends rich. That's what happened there. Like KBR is owned by Halliburton. K mm -hmm. KBR and Halliburton made so much goddamn money off of the Iraq war. It's, it's insane. And we accomplished, uh, what did we accomplish? Anybody? Nothing. Yeah. Not a goddamn <laughs> yeah. thing. We didn't do shit. Um, people forget that Dick Cheney was the Secretary of Defense back in the day when we started making deals. And his underling was the Secretary of Defense, Rumsfeld. Yep. Right, Donald. Like you, Donald you see Rice all these though. pictures of these assholes oh. shaking hands with Saddam Hussein, selling him weapons while we were behind his back selling weapons to Iran as well. By the way, uh, during their yeah. war, but uh, as soon as they came into a position of real power, mm -hmm. the first thing they did was like, "How can we?" It wasn't like, "Should we go to war with Iraq?" It's how could can we go to war with Iraq, right? And how right. I don't know how many friends that we've all lost because of that bullshit. Not just to the war, but to fucking blowing their goddamn brains out afterwards. Not to mention this five trillion dollars we wasted on that shit. Um, yeah. yeah, I completely agree with you there. And he, he's taken so much heat from not just uh, retired, but in some case active military commanders and DOD people for, like, pulling out of Syria and other shit like that. Um, yeah. I, it, to me, it's like the world is on its head in that case. Like, yeah. there's, there's plenty of reasons in my estimation to talk shit about Trump, but his handling sure. of foreign policy is not one of them. Like, that's why he's so electable, in my opinion, because uh, his foreign policy, for the most part, is it's brash and very rude, but that's how he does business. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. that's fine. And you can't really say a whole lot about the economic well, part. Well, look, uh, other countries have been shitting on America for a while. Um, mm -hmm. I don't mind yeah. somebody who's in there that is brash and unapologetic. Uh, I actually like Trump, by the way. So I, I voted for him last uh, in 2016. I'm going to vote for him again in 2020. So you don't need yeah. my you don't need my vote on this one. Um, <laughs> have you met him in person or his family? I have. I've, I've met uh, President Trump twice. He came out to Dover um, when Shannon's remains were returned to the states, um, and then he didn't just do a, a you know photo line handshake type of thing. There, he he actually gave the opportunities uh, the opportunity to all the families who had someone killed to meet him privately. So I got to chat with him for about 15 minutes privately. Um, and what struck me was that he, he had obviously read up on Shannon. So I was, I was personally touched that he took the time to like read about her and knew her. Mm -hmm. um, but he also asked me, he knew my background and where I was coming from. And he asked me what I thought of the situation on the ground, which at that point I had over 20 years in and, and uh, 
you know, you get asked that every now and again, but not by senior leaders at that level. They usually kind of look right through you. They're not, they're not who you really want to talk to. Right. Or, you know, um, but he wanted to hear what my perspective was on the from you know a guy who'd been on the ground in Iraq and Syria and some other places. Um, so I, I could kind of tell he was thinking thinking differently. What's that? Were you nervous to tell him, or did you tell him your your full thoughts, or did you hold back? Yeah, you know? I did. We we didn't have when we had a little bit of time to talk. Uh, but at first, when he asked me, I was a little bit like, I can't believe he's asking me this. So I gave him, uh, you know, my my general opinions. You know, I still tried to keep it kind of PC, um, but. You know, I was really impressed that he wanted to hear what I had to say. Uh, I met him again at a, an event he held at the White House. Um, and then his his administration and his family has been very open, especially as the more op-eds I've written and, and more uh, more I've publicly shared my opinion. They've, you know, reached out usually behind the scenes and just said, hey, what do you what do you think about this? What are your two cents? You know, I don't think I have any amount of influence or whatever, but I, I do think that they're looking for outside opinions outside of the D.C. think tank. DC Beltway lobbyist um, chain that dominates kind of that uh, that realm in general. Mm. So I, I mean, the the administration has an unconventional approach by uh, DC standards. You're, oh yeah, yeah you're sure, not the yeah. first person that said that to us. Um, a, a lot of people, because we're Dan and I are friends with a couple of people who you, who used to be on his staff, and mm. they said the same thing. Like, whoever had the best idea wins essentially. Well, I think we need to. Re- yeah. I I really think we need to reexamine what it is to be president and what that means. Because people have a lot of ideas about what it should be. Like, is the president the moral leader of the country, for example? I don't know if that's yeah. the case. Like, I feel like uh, Trump is Trump is a businessman, and the, the rhetoric he uses I find problematic sometimes, but it's the rhetoric that he's been using for 50 years as a businessman. That's what he's learned yeah. uh, in negotiation. Like, hey, sometimes you got to make threats. Like, typically in politics, you just don't make threats, particularly when it comes – to foreign policy, people see that as hawkish. But when you're making threats and the result of your threat is that one, reprisals don't happen, and two, you're actually pulling military out of bad situations, I feel like you have to weigh the body of evidence versus what he's actually saying. For mm-hmm. example, the Syria thing. Like, we shouldn't have been there probably in the first place, to be honest. Like, let Russia can do what the fuck they want in Syria. I don't give two fucks about Syria. Yeah. Let them have it, for all I care. Um, but <clears throat> that's an unpopular opinion Amongst the, it was a, an unpopular opinion against a lot of people in the military because a lot of the lower enlisted, particularly, are trained to be chomping at the bit. Like we want to go fuck shit up all the time. Yeah, that's that's kind of our thing, and that's I think it's reflected. The military Times did a poll between October and December last year um, of active duty service members, and their uh, opinion of Trump was forty two percent favorable and fifty percent unfavorable. And I think that has something to do with it. Frankly, I think those people that they probably talked to were people that wanted to go fuck shit up. Like they, I think they feel like they missed the war in a lot of ways. Mm, That's Um, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, But again, it's not, I don't think it's the president's job to be the moral leader of the country or to, to speak softly and carry a big stick or any of that shit. I feel like it's his job to negotiate and, and lead the charge in that way. It's to be a CEO of of the country. And, uh, (sighs) That's that's who he is as a person. Mm-hmm. So it kind of works out yeah. a little bit. And it's it's I don't like, for example, if you had a broken leg, you're not going to go to a mechanic. If you want to talk about morality and ethics and shit like that, go find a philosopher or a sociologist. Exactly. And they can do that. They can lead that charge. But if we're talking about foreign policy and economics, mm-hmm. get somebody that does deals for a living. That yeah. makes sense. That makes sense to me. Again, I'm not a uh, an I, avid Trump supporter or anything, but I, I think wholeheartedly that agree. And, and I, that's yeah. and by the way, those are the two bi- the, the two things that you mentioned is the two biggest reasons that I'm re-voting for him, if you want to call it that. I'm voting for yeah. him again. Is uh, yeah. I think he's done well with foreign policy, and I think he's done great with the economy. The rest yeah. of it, yes, it's like you said, Dan. Could he be uh, a little better at it? You bet. In handling, in particular, the the George Floyd situation and. And other things like that. Yeah. Yes, he could be a, a little more well spoken uh, or well versed on it. But uh, for, for me personally, the two biggest things that I'm looking for in a president are economics and foreign policy. Um, yeah, so- I think a lot of people don't understand or they have a different concept of what a president should be. I think a lot of folks, like you said, are looking for a moral authority of some sort, probably because there's a lot of that missing from today's society mm. in America, which is a whole deeper conversation. But I think a lot of people, they're either too lazy to look at who their local leaders are and, and you know, vote on that ballot because it's complicated. So they just want this one guy who's in D.C., you know, for me on the West Coast, that's 3,000 miles away. 
to be in charge of like everything. But if you really look at the scope of responsibility for the president, foreign policy is is huge. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is, is helping out with the economy and just kind of staying out of the way of the economy, really making trade deals. Yeah. But I mean, it's a very executive job. So to mm. to want all this other stuff from him to me is just it, 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 it speaks to how people view the world. If you're looking right. for a moral authority, man, like you like you said, you need to go find that somewhere else. And that probably needs to be someone that you really actually know and can touch, not some dude that shows up on TV or on Twitter every now and again. <laughs> well, he yeah. shows up on Twitter more than now and again. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, well, for, for a president, it's hard to be great at all of those different things. Like, yeah. I hear, you know, a lot of my friends from, from Los Angeles talk about how great Obama was and all that other stuff, right? He seemed like a very cool guy. He seemed sure, like yeah. he was, he was a, a great speaker. No one is taking that well, away from him. But a lot of the policies and everything else that it took to be a president, I, I think he personally failed on. And yeah. what do you want? I think it's it's looking at people in the eye and saying, what do you want from a president? Well, you don't want to do want somebody who's cool and could be your, your buddy. Or do you want somebody right. who's actually going to get shit well, done? Funny, and I think that's we had the just, difference. We had just made that mistake by electing George W. Bush because we thought he was an affable, cool guy that we would want to hang out yeah, with. Yeah, you was do a, a key bump with him on the weekends. That was, a, crash huge, a, that was, that was a huge mistake. He, <laughs> he, he's the guy that led to this neoconservative nonsense where we're doing yeah. like if you remember his campaigning in 2000 was like we're not going to do nation building anymore and blah 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 he was railing against clinton for doing nation building yeah and the first opportunity he got we started fucking doing that shit <laughs> like the first opportunity yeah. Yeah. not only that but he presided over the largest expansion of the federal government in u.s history mm -hmm. um yep. and the largest domestic spying program in u.s history and all this other stuff stuff that is completely at odds with the idea of conservatism you know what i mean right in the same way that Neoliberalism is not classical liberalism. Like we, we Frank Luntz, uh, that piece of shit, has turned the word liberal into a bad word. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's, that's not how any of this was supposed to happen. <laughs> but here we are, right? Yeah. So I, let's, let's get back to, uh, to uh, Donnie, uh, Donnie T. <laughs> I he goes by. by the way, I like the, the nickname that CNN has created for his son. They What's, call him uh, DJ TJ. Oh, that's actually pretty good. Teacher, teacher. I like, I'm, a big, I'm a big yeah. fan of that. That's the first. That's kind of cool. That's I'm a big first, fan of that. First thing CNN's done right in a while. Uh, yeah. Uh, so let's talk about. There's a there's a number of things that Trump has actually done for the military. Now I don't like the way he gets heat for some. Like I like to, I bring the thunder against people that piss me off, mm -hmm. regardless of who they are. In what party? I don't give two fucks about any of that stuff. So yeah. I I rail on Trump all the time, but it doesn't <laughs> like if you if you want to be real and have your word carry any kind of weight, you have to, like, attack shit that matters and is real and not, like, essentially what we have in the public discourse right now is people are just resharing Facebook memes. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But they're, yeah. ta they're talking about it. And I'm not talking about people at home. I'm talking about politicians and the media right. are doing this shit. So there's plenty of reasons to rail on this dude, but his treatment of the military, aside from the, the recent stuff, like trying to use them for shit that, they're, that I don't think they should be used for... Um, Here's what he didn't do. He didn't spend a fucking gajillion dollars on the on, on a new jet that doesn't work right. You know what I mean? He didn't, right. he didn't yeah. do stupid shit like that. He increased readiness. Everybody talks so much shit when he came up with the phrase Space Force. But we've, like, this has been nece uh, a necessity since the 1970s. And yeah. no one's done it. Reagan tried to do it with the Star Wars program. They mm -hmm. laughed him out of the fucking building. But what happens when... China or Russia can launch satellites into space whenever they feel like it, including a weapon on a satellite. Oh, yeah. And we don't have yeah. anything going on up there. You fucking kidding me? Yeah. That's how you want to play this? You want to make fun of him because he's doing shit that we've been trying to do for 35 fucking years? If like, Elon Musk sense. is able to smoke a joint with Joe Rogan and then send a rocket into space six yeah. months later, you bet yeah. your ass we need a, some form of, of space force up there because... I yeah. guarantee you there's a there's an Elon Musk in China and there's one in Russia as well who are working on the same shit to take down our country. Yeah, for sure. And I, yeah. I so I wonder uh just from your perspective and your organization's perspective, what is it that Trump in in twenty twenty and beyond planning to do for military military veterans that's that's that sets him apart? So I think the I think the biggest thing is staying on his current like America first trajectory. Like he's already indicated that he wants to get out of Afghanistan and in that war, which I think is huge. Um, I think Syria is next. So kind of putting our traditional GWAT to bed with those massive, huge deployments that have cost us lives and, and continue to be a massive uh, drain on, of resources so that we can refocus on, in particular, what China's doing um, and in particular, what Russia's doing. And, and I think 
what Trump brings to the table is that he doesn't just view the military as the only game in town. And this is what I think brings a lot of heat from the, uh, the generals who've gotten accustomed to over the last 20 years, the generals in the military kind of get listened to no matter what, whereas Trump will use them as a tool in his toolbox and then he'll rely on other tools. So I think Trump is going to, uh, rely heavily on uh, tariffs and using our economic mm. advantage to strike back against China. Um, and then same thing with Russia as well, uh, kind of letting Russia overextend itself um, so we can buffer back against them uh, in Europe and then hopefully let them, like you said, screw around in Syria to their detriment and we can get out of there because yeah. there's, no, there's no gain for us there. Let them, dude. Yeah. Look at how much money we spent trying to keep the Soviet Union out of Cuba. One, we didn't keep them out of shit. No. And we lost every major fucking battle we fought. <laughs> like, what the fuck are we doing for years? And we still have these weird ass goddamn tariffs and 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 uh, boycotts against Cuba. Like, why didn't we just go down there and buy all their shit? It doesn't make any sense. Like, we should have just went down there and bought everything. Tiny like, hey, country. Hey, here's yeah. here's fucking fifty billion dollars a year for nothing. Yeah, let's do this. Let's get weird. Because look, when people get used to fucking, especially these days, when they used to having the ability to do whatever the fuck they want mm-hmm. to be able to go out and get boozed up, watch Netflix whenever they want. They stop giving a shit about stupid bullshit like communism. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. That goes I mean, out that the window. Goes the fuck away. Uh, we fucked that up in every possible way that you could fuck it up. But it was, it was the cold war ideology and it's so stupid. I, I agree with you with regard to the generals, by the way, all these generals are still stuck in a goddamn cold war. In my opinion, yeah. they, they, they want to protect their little fiefdoms or fiefdoms. However you say that goddamn word. Uh, at all costs. So whenever they feel threatened, they they use their power and authority. And this is what I railed on Mattis about last week. They use their power and authority to fucking weaken the country, essentially, because they're trying to yeah. protect their own position instead of protecting the country at large. That's why when people are like, oh, fucking Mattis is a hero to the military. It's not a, it's a fucking officer, dude. My heroes are very, very frequently officers. Florent Groberg is a hero, right? Right. But General Mattis, I mean, how many gunfights has he been in? Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. What, what were your thoughts on Mattis's remarks against Trump uh, a couple of weeks ago? I mean, the media has created this environment where if you, no matter what your previous sins were, if you come out and say something against Trump, the media is going to hold you up as this hero mm. um, that's speaking truth to power. When really, if you look at Mattis's records, I, I, I think he was a, I think he is a very effective military commander when he is applied towards a certain task. Like, for instance, mm-hmm. when when he was working for Trump and Trump said, Hey, I need someone to go crush the caliphate right now. Mm. Mattis was your guy. Like yep. and he went and he did it, but that doesn't mean that Mattis gets to circumvent the chain of command while he's in and say, you know what? I don't like your policy. Cause there was a lot of stuff that went on during the Obama administration and the Bush administration that a lot of us didn't like. Um, so, I mean, he's a free citizen. Now that he's out, he resigned. He can say whatever he wants to say. Um, mm. But there's everyone should realize there's bad blood there, and they should look at the circumstances on on which that Mattis decided to leave government service. I mean, Trump essentially said, "Hey, man, good job. You guys crushed the caliphate. Now the war is over." And Mattis threw a tantrum because he didn't want to have his war end. And the media was really, really quick to grab him and say, "Oh, here we go. We got a defector. Let's go ahead and hold this guy up as the golden boy who's going to speak truth, speak you know, quote air quotes, truth to power." against trump when really people just can't look objectively at it and be like so wait trump's a bad guy because he wants to get us out of a war right it's weird how that how that fucking tide turns and how people's opinions are so easily swayed let's keep in mind that uh general mattis or secretary mattis however you want to refer to him is on the board of general dynamics which is a right they're a they're a war profiteering organization just like halliburton that's all they are like look some of these companies Back in the 50s and 60s, a lot of these companies went to great lengths to make sure that the country was taken care of. Mm-hmm. The same way that fucking Hollywood actors and athletes left their fucking professions to go fight in the war. Ted Williams, Joe DiMaggio, so many people you could name. You could list off hundreds of these guys that stopped in the middle of their peak career to go fight in the fucking war. Elvis Presley, for Christ's sake. Yeah. Um, that is not the case anymore. And it's... I don't even know what to say about that, to be honest. Like, we, we haven't... I don't, I don't know when the last time... I guess it, it's a matter of circumstance because I don't know when the last time we fought a, a truly just war was. I guess bouncing... I guess Desert Shield and Storm were good. 
like we Kuwait was in the early getting attacked. 90s. Yeah, Kuwait was getting attacked, and we had to repel that attack. That that made sense to me. But ever since then, and v, it certainly wasn't Vietnam. I want to circle back to something you just said. Is that organization that you just named the reason why you think Mattis wanted to stay in Syria? Um, I don't. I, I, I'm not going to assume any of that. But okay. I know that from 2013 to 2017, and between his military service and his government service, that's what he did. He was on the board of that organization. Okay. And it's the same story from Dick Cheney. Dick Cheney was the Secretary of Defense back in the day. He was a congressman and then Secretary of Defense for a while, and then mm-hmm. he worked for Halliburton. Yeah, because I'm, I'm curious as to, from both of you guys, um, why it is important or, or seemingly is important for Mattis to have kept that war going. You, you were the one, uh, Joe, who brought it up first. Um, yeah. I, I, I mean, from I a think, civilian think... perspective, help us understand, and, and people who are maybe yeah. out there who are listening who are undecided on this election, uh, what is yeah. important about that? I think some Dan hit on earlier that the military is designed to do a specific task. The military is designed to go to war. And so there's always going to be a large element of the military. It's an all volunteer force. Everyone joined, maybe for some benefits here and there, but not, really everyone not joined now. To, if you yeah, if you join for college benefits now, you're a fucking dumb dumb. We've been we've <laughs> right, been exactly. we've been at war yeah, for yeah, nineteen yeah. goddamn years, dude. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot to go so, to college I mean, for. Yeah. Everyone now knows they're going to get it on. So all the way down from your lowest private who made is seeking adventure and he wants to go on a war, all the way up to your senior generals. The senior generals have just become accustomed to, we've never left these wars. We sort of left Iraq and then we went back. Why don't we just stay at war? Because we don't want to go back to, I, I joined the army in 98. We don't want to go back to the 90s when deployments were like few and there was, there was no real deployments. There was like some little peacekeeping here and there, mm-hmm. but they don't want to go back to taking the back seat. And, and also in the DC power game, the generals have been extremely powerful mm-hmm. and remain powerful while we're mm-hmm. at war. They get to dictate foreign policy. They get to punch. I'm, I don't want to say like way above the weight class, like they don't have the minds to do it, but that's not the way that our government works. We elect civilian leaders who have, the full suite of tools at their disposal, um, but they're not supposed to let the non-elected officials take over and dictate policy. So Trump has gotten a lot of flack from the establishment, the deep state, the swamp, whatever you want to call it, but the people that are in government long term, because he's kind of looked under the hood as a as an executive and said, this works, this doesn't work. And when he starts pointing at things that don't work, that have been in power, military, for instance, for so long, and Trump's like, why are these guys dictating our foreign policy? That's not how it's supposed to work. I'm supposed to be in charge. And then he starts making changes. Mm-hmm. Man, since that hasn't been done in so long, you're going to start seeing a lot of pushback. And that's that's what I think we've seen where Trump had his generals and he had some support from the military initially. Because remember, when he came in office, ISIS had taken over two, almost three countries with what they were doing in Libya. They were forcing massive amounts of refugees into Europe. They're cutting off people's heads on TV. Trump needed a strong military. So He needed those generals. But as soon as that problem was solved, he was like, hey, guys, now I'm going to use some diplomacy and I'm going to start getting us out of here. I'm going to have other folks come in that have more of an interest in this area and take over. And they did not like that. They weren't used to that. So that's I think that to me explains a lot of the flack that Trump has gotten from the establishment. Got it. I think it's important. The conversation we're having right now uh that we see things in perspective and hold people accountable for what they're doing and what their intent is uh, meant to be. Like if we're going to judge Trump on being, and I, I personally feel he is very petulant. His Twitter bullshit is, is it's stupid and distracting. Um, but it's not his job to not be those things. Maybe, maybe it's his job to make sure that we have a strong economy and a strong foreign policy and, it's hard to it's hard to argue that he's not done that. But pre COVID, like in January, CNN put out an article that said, "Well, now Trump can clearly run on a on a great economy." Right. Like he, it's there's very little chance he's going to lose at this point because the economy is so great. Um, you can debate what is or isn't good for the country with regard to foreign policy, but what you can't debate is what classical conservatism says, the Monroe Doctrine, and all this other stuff that we keep our fucking hands to ourselves until we got to go fuck somebody up. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like we, <clears throat> there are cases of true evil, like Nazis, where we have to go kill every single one of these motherfuckers, right? And then there are cases 
like Vietnam where hey these people live differently than us and we think our idea is better and we want to stop their idea from spreading so we're going to go fight them in their home country I think that is morally reprehensible behavior personally um, like I, I feel like we should use other tools in our toolbox to make sure that the world is the world that we want to see I think we have a superior culture to a lot of other people like we promote uh, women and minorities who have historically since the dawn of humanity have been fucked over right we we do a pretty decent job even though we fuck up frequently of putting that at the forefront of our agenda right we do a lot of great things here and when the the bar is so high that when something small happens everybody loses their shit and i think that's a good thing Mm -hmm. and in a lot of ways it's it sucks sometimes but i think it's a good thing but i do as well by the way yeah we we need we need some perspective on who's doing what and why and what their intent is if somebody is like you said with the with the toolbox kind of metaphor the the military is a hammer into a hammer yes. every problem looks like a nail right and not every yep. problem is a goddamn nail it's just not how it works so if <laughs> first of all general shouldn't be advocating for war in the first fucking place they should be ready for war obviously but imagine the hubris of thinking that you and your organization are the only people that can get a job done, especially when the last 20 years of history show that you haven't right. fucking gotten shit done. <laughs> not a great track record. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and it's not just the last 20 years. I mean, desert storm and desert shield. I think those were good efforts on our part, but Panama, we set that whole thing up. Like we fucking kill. We, the, the, the agency helped fucking murder general Torejo, even though he was a cunt. Um, and then we put Manuel Noriega in power, let him do his thing under our fucking guidance, and then arrested him for it, right? And before that, you have Vietnam. We should not have been there. And before that, Korea. Probably shouldn't have been there either. You know what I mean? Right. So what the fuck track record are you running on, bitch? Like, why do you have so much moral authority because you're a general? You guys have fucked it up for decades now. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty yeah. crazy when you think about it. The last, you know, 50 so years of our country, uh, as far as the track record for wars and why they were started. And that's uh, an academic debate. But think about the social debate that surrounds that. Think about all the men and women who have died and, and the survivors of those people, but also the service members who look, man, it's a tough job. It sucks. People lose their family members like Joe did. People lose their own lives very frequently. And the only thing that keeps us going through all that pain and suffering is knowing that the country is worth fighting for and that we're on a mission that is ethical and good. And when we find out after the fact that it's not, you see what happens. You see what happens in Vietnam. You see yeah. what happens now with fucking people blowing their goddamn brains out all over the place. It's we. <laughs> I, I can't state how important it is to reduce these people down to their actions and not their titles like what did you do Mm -hmm. what did you actually do oh he's he's a fucking general i thought the military loved generals like i love people who i want to fight i always wanted to fight but give me something to fight for you know what i mean don't send me on some fucking fool's errand and then wave the flag behind me to make your fucking point fuck you buddy how about that yeah, well said. Yeah. Um, Joe, since you're engaged in uh, politics, the, po- the political side of things now, uh, how shocked were you that Joe Biden got the nomination? Because all, <laughs> all we've, from the Democratic side, all we've been hearing since 2016 is, here's what we don't want. We definitely don't right. want an old, rich, white, racist nominee uh, who's, yeah. who's a male. And they've yep. checked all of the boxes of everything that they said that they did not want. Um, I, yeah. me personally, I, I was shocked. Um, and I didn't think it was going to happen when, when all the nominees first jumped in. I, I think I was leaning yeah. more towards Kamala Harris toward the beginning. How, <laughs> how did they end up at Joe Biden and what's it like from on your side of it? Uh, l- looking at it now. I mean, to me, I, I think it really speaks to how the, the Democrats have not had the, the same like revolution or uprising that the Republicans had in 2016, because going into 2016, I thought, oh crap, man! This, I was like really kind of losing faith. I was like, we're gonna pick fucking Jeb Bush. Jeb, yeah, or, that's right. He or, was the or favorite. One of these tools, and like, what? We might as well just have a monarchy at that point, I guess. Like, it's gonna be it's gonna be Jeb Bush versus Hillary Clinton. Like, yeah. what, what, <laughs> yeah. what are we doing here? But but Trump came in and he was speaking to like a lot of people that were disenfranchised with the way that politics were, 
And, you know, hey, man, it's a crazy world that the guy that ran the Apprentice Show came in and flipped it on its head. But like I said earlier, he started by pointing out the flaws in the Republican Party. The Democrats will not tolerate that shit. They no. had some people that came in with different ideas. Bernie, he's old, he's kooky. I don't agree with anything that he says, but he has different ideas. Mm. Tulsi Gabbard, who I, I really like, I respect her, fellow veteran. She had some different ideas. And she said, hey, this is where the DNC is messed up. And she went after Hillary. And they freaking, they, you know, basically just took her out. It didn't, know, it didn't, right it didn't matter that she was a military officer, by the way. No. She was right, fair exactly. game because nope. she wasn't telling the same story that they were. Yeah. That's how that no, works, by the way. Yeah, they call her a Russian agent. A Russian they agent, yeah. Like a, like, you know, a, a sympathetic to Assad and all this garbage. So <laughs> the Democrats picking Joe Biden, like, I think a lot of the hate we're seeing right now thrown towards Trump and even a lot of these activist, activist mayors and uh, governors that are letting their states burn right now, I, I think there's just a lot of internal frustration on the left that they yeah. haven't been able to coalesce an ideology behind an actual leader. Um, and then that the DNC is still very much in charge with the big dollars that they're going to put their establishment pick right up front. Oh yeah, for sure. Look, they've got as much to lose from the, the swamp system going down as anybody else. And they just won't admit it. Like they're like, yeah, the, you can't be a reform party when you were invented in 1790s. Yeah. Motherfucker. <laughs> Cause that's a while back. Yeah. yeah. That's a while back. Long time ago. The, the weirdest part about the democratic nomination is, if you look at what's going on today and with the protests um, in particular, in, I mean, literally today, right? if it would have been Bernie Sanders, because let's face it, the DNC was the one who orchestrated the takeout of, of Bernie Sanders. Yeah. If you don't yeah. come, it, it, the, the whole nomination came down to that South Carolina vote that Biden won. And then the following day, he got out uh, Klobuchar, uh, yeah. Buttigieg, and all those Buttigieg. guys wasn't splitting up the votes anymore. So it was just Biden against Bernie. And they were able to, yep. to allow Biden. Uh, Biden to get in there if they hadn't and Bernie would have won the nomination I can guarantee fucking to you he would have about been out in the streets for the last 14 days with everyone else from the Democratic Party and there could have been a real revolution on that yes. side with somebody who's a different uh, has a different set of ideas and me personally yep. look I, I don't believe in anything Bernie Sanders uh, does right. politically however that's not the case right now. Like it's no. it's it's whoever you think might have great ideas. Trump mm -hmm. wasn't a politician. Bernie's not a conventional politician. Well, and I think that would have helped him in today's world. Probably, yeah, um, just being different. Yeah, I yes. Think. Totally. Just just two things on that. One, I think you do agree with Bernie a lot more than you say you do. And I don't mean me personally. His or? specific policies. I mean the intent behind them. The intent behind Bernie Sanders. I don't mm -hmm. think he. I I honestly believe that Hillary Clinton is an evil human being. I think Bernie Sanders I, I do is a, as well. I think Bernie yeah. Sanders is a good guy that was very heavily influenced by by socialism in his in his youth mm -hmm. and it's carried over because things are so uh like the gap between billionaires and people who are struggling is is very apparent to a lot of people and it's not just black people and brown people in urban areas it's fucking white farmers and white people that live in rural areas they're getting fucked over just as hard as anybody else right mm -hmm. I think the idea behind what he says is that we need to take care of people. Now, the the problematic part is just that you differ in opinion on how that happens, right? So from the Republican side or the conservative side, not necessarily re Republicans these days, but from the conservative side, that is, let's give people the tools. Let's teach men to fish, right? And from the Democratic side, it's like, hey, let's just give everybody fish. Right. And the latter is just unsustainable. That's why that parable exists. Like, it's, it's so fucking obvious. I don't understand how anybody can be a Democrat, to be honest. Like, I understand it as a form of rebellion. I don't either, which like is why you were like, you, you think that I, I agree with No, Bernie no, no. Sanders. I think in principle that you, as just like every other fucking sensible, ethical American human being, believes that we should do everything we can to take care of all the, as many people as we can. Like, look, you've got to put some effort in as a human being as well. Yeah. But we have to take care of people and fix injustice where it exists. And that's his point. I just think his methodology is bad. Right. So I can I can listen to what Bernie Sanders has to say. Uh, absolutely. When Hillary, when Hillary yeah. Clinton okay. starts talking, I'm like, shut the fuck up. Right. You are an evil piece yeah. of shit. And when the Bushes start talking, you know, you know uh, that they're not the first Bushes to be in public office, right? Franklin Pierce, one of our presidents, is uh, yeah. uh, lineage. Bar Barbara Barbara Pierce. Yeah. That's Barbara <clears throat> Bush's maiden name. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't yeah. know that. 
I didn't yeah. know that. The, yeah. the Pierces they, were in the, yeah. the lineage. And, and the, Rod- the Rodhams have been in, in business and politics for 200 years in this country. So let's not pretend like this shit just came out of nowhere. These are fucking oligarchs. They're trying to turn us into Russia, which is funny because they accused all the Republicans of being Russian agents. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> like they're literally trying to turn this country into an oligarchy. Well, look, now you got Billy Bush on what extra and uh, the other <laughs> one. Yeah, the other one's with Hoda in the morning. So, well, you got, you know, you got mixing the, it up. You've got the young George and then the Prescott, the Prescott, the third. He's he's making a run to in Texas. I think. No shit. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, there's a, they're all they're everywhere. I didn't know that. Uh, Joe, th- you're an unbelievably fascinating guy. Uh, this is the point in the show. Where we get to the drinking bro of the week, which is someone who has inspired you or helped you become the person you are today. Can be a man or woman, obviously. Um, who would you like to give the the drinking bro of the week to? Oh man, um, that's tough. Let's go with uh, let's go with e- easiest one is uh, my da- my dad and mom. I guess I'll do two. Okay, yeah. dad and mom. Absolutely. Yeah. So absolutely. Like we've my, got my like we've got rules. We're gonna kick <laughs> yeah, yeah, We're yeah. gonna kick them off the show. Shame. No shame. It's just shame. one piece yeah. of shit. <laughs> <laughs> out of the autonomous zone yeah <laughs> yeah so my, my parents uh chris and mary kid they supported me even when i was a crazy kid and wanted to join the military which coming from portland oregon is like the craziest thing you can do um and then all the way up until uh shannon was killed and they you know said hey buy a house down the street from us and we'll help take care of the kids so they've been been there throughout my entire life so big shout out to mom and dad that's awesome, man. That's awesome. Where can everybody find you on social media and uh, and, and all your, your organizations? Yeah, your, well. your organizations. Because uh, look, I mean, again, I'm not a huge Trump guy, but you, if you're you out there who are voters, you need to go out and fucking listen to what everybody's got to say, and you also need to weigh that against their body of work. Like all these people that are calling Trump racist, look at he. he economically speaking, he's the best president for black people in the history of this goddamn country. Mm-hmm. Without, it's like yep. uh, by a margin of like two hundred percent. It's not even close. So anyways, yeah. yeah, tell us where we, the people could find your. Yeah, Twitter's probably the easiest one. It's just Joe Kent, 16 Jan, uh, 19. So that's the day Shannon was killed. Mm. Um, yeah, it's probably the easy, easiest one. Okay, awesome, man. Uh, we appreciate it. Do you guys have a name for the book yet? Yeah, it's uh, Send to Me. So that was kind of some words we live by. It's like a uh, Bible quote. Yeah, from Isaiah, also. yeah. Isaiah 16, something or other. Yep, yeah. exactly. Who will go for us? Yeah. Send me. That's yep. great, man. Well, look out for that yeah. uh, the end of next year. Potentially, hopefully in the next year, maybe early 2022, depending on powers out of our, our control. Mm. I'd, t- I'd say what? Why don't you come back on the show when it's when it's about to come out? Uh, we'd love to have you, man. You were awesome. Yeah, man, yeah. I'd love to. Great. Great. So let's let's do that. Um, is, is, when your yeah, book definitely. is is coming out, uh, we'll have you back on Drinking Bros podcast. We appreciate you taking time out of your day today for D'Anthony Holloway, Joe Kent. I am Ross Patterson. This is the Drinking Bros. Good night, everyone. It's Isaiah 68, by the way. Exactly, yep. <laughs>